Thank you for listening to the Black and Gold Hockey Podcast. Please support the show by subscribing to and leaving a five-star rating for the show on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Podbean, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, and any of your favorite podcast platforms. You can also support the show by going to our website, blackandgoldhockey.com, where there's always exciting articles by the BNG writing staff. While you're there, don't forget to click on the fanatics.com banner for a great sports fan shopping experience. Are you, are you done yet? We gotta start the show. <laughs> Hey everyone's fans, welcome back to the Black and Gold Hockey Podcast. This is episode 229 and we're recording on May 29th, 2021. And this episode is brought to you by betonline.ag. Please go to betonline.ag and use code CLNS50. We have a big show, not as big as uh, as we normally do. It's kind of an agenda free, but the Boston Bruins are going to the second round of the playoffs against the New York Islanders. We got through Washington, the Washington Capitals, and everything is looking good. Second round starting tonight. That's why we're doing this podcast tonight. We do have a very, very uh, special guest with us to join us and kind of a roundtable uh, discussion about uh, how we feel about the Washington series, how we're feeling about the, the upcoming Islanders series. But before all that jazz, hands, woo! I want to uh, welcome in my co-host, Heather Ingerson. Heather, how are you doing on this Memorial Day weekend down here in the States that is rainy and sucky and I hate it? Yeah, well, you know, Memorial Day weekend goes uh, one way or another. It's either 90 and beautiful or 50 and raining like today, but yay, it's, <laughs> let's go round two. Yes. Yeah, we got a special guest. Can't wait to get him in. And my aunt's friend. Gave me one of the playoff rally rags from the game last week. So nice. You know, I collect the rags. I have one every year. I get yeah, some man. One. Oh, I can't even. Can you see it? There no, I can it is see it. From the garden. From her. Nice. She says to my aunt, um, it might be a little dirty. And my aunt's like, um, it's a hockey rally rag. <laughs> I, yeah, we need it in the and house. Look at, so and look at us supporting, supporting the black and gold. Woo, woo. Yeah, buddy. Very nice. I had someone say to me the other day, I had the, um, uh, my black and gold sweatshirt on. And they must have obviously thought things. He's like, I let you go in first just because of your sweatshirt. Thank you. That's awesome. It's like a family. So happy Memorial Day weekend, sir. Glad to see you again. We're a little wonky. We're doing things a little different, but let's go yeah. round two. Let's do bet online. Let's get our guest in. Woo. Yes. Go. All right. Let's hear from our great folks at betonline.ag. Betonline.ag has the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. Baseball is in full swing and you can track the boys of summer at betonline.ag get all the latest news odds and information on your sporting needs including major league baseball nba nhl pga tour golf and all your ufc mma action real-time updated odds and props on almost anything you can imagine betonline.ag has you covered for all the news scores and odds it's the best way to place your bets and it's free to sign up before the next pitch, head over to betonline.ag on your laptop or mobile device and take advantage of the 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Don't sit on the sidelines anymore, folks. Get in on the action. Don't forget to use the code CLNS50, that's CLNS50, to receive a 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Betonline.ag, your online sportsbook experts. All right, so... Let's get our guest in. I want to say thank you to Bet Online for staying with us for as long as they have. They've been awesome. 
and uh, uh, we appreciate them every day. Uh, so let's get this in. Um, I have a, a special guest, a good friend, and uh, I call him the Maritime Madman. He is Steve McEachern, and he is up in the Maritimes of Canada, diehard Boston Bruins fan. Let's get him in here. Let's talk some Boston Bruins hockey. Steve McEachern, how you doing, buddy? Very good. Happy to be here. Awesome. Um, we, we had some we, – we were trying to do a roundtable earlier this week, but the technical difficulties were just – annoying and you remember this because you were sitting here through it it was just the weirdest thing that i could I, I was sitting there talking and i could hear feedback like somebody was typing very loudly on a keyboard and i i tried to get through it but it was just like it was just so much i i just we, we couldn't do it we, yeah. i couldn't move forward because i was either gonna uh scream or just jump out my window so <laughs> we put a kibosh on it but we got together and we put this plan, this little, little bit of a roundtable, agenda-free Boston Bruins, Stanley Cup playoff-style uh, edition together. So uh, thanks for uh, joining us, and uh, hopefully everything is well. Um, is it? Do I see sun in the background up in the Maritimes? Well, not for long. We're supposed to get what you guys are getting. Usually <laughs> about eight hours later, whatever you guys get, that's what we get. So it's, exactly. it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Well, good. Right. You two can be chilly and wet. That's just, I guess, the coastline on the Atlantic here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just wait five minutes. It'll change. Yes, <laughs> right, exactly. it is. So much like New England. Uh, yeah. let me take well, thanks for coming on coffee. with us, Steve. No problem. I always, I always like to talk about the Boston Bruins. Okay. All right. So why don't we start off with, um, Heather, why don't we go first, ladies first, of course. Um, our thoughts on the Washington Capitals series. Um, some maybe just a couple of pinpoints that you saw in that series that were good, bad, and, and what we can expect to move forward onto the second round. Um, I mean, I think overall they played all right. It was kind of the series we thought it would be, you know, they're pretty evenly matched teams. They were, you know, really physical. We knew it, it as playing Washington always is, it always gets more physical. They it's like we talk about, sometimes it's weird. They're very physical. And then sometimes everyone's like, Oh, they're not physical enough, but they seem to play all right, but they had a, still had a lot of not playing the full 60 and sloppy moments. And there are a few games that obviously are very close and we were lucky that we did get the points. But that being said, overall, I think we were a better team. Washington was having their issues. Uh, I do would like to see a little more of um. We had like the lines individually popping off as opposed to having a lot of all the lines like we were doing the last few games of the season were really like hopeful like yeah this is it we're getting into our prime spot uh but overall i mean it was a good win a good confidence booster but exactly what we didn't want to happen happened and we're playing the islanders which makes me a lot more nervous than the capitals um just in some ways, not because I don't think we can beat the Islanders, but the Islanders just have our number, man. That's just, they've got a lot of things. But I think going forward, I just would like to see us maybe be more rounded, you know, really play that full 60 like we know we can and we get frustrated. It's good. We're getting some of our defense back, potentially, you know, to get in the lineup. So for matchups or whatever. And I don't know, it's going to be a good series. I think it might go longer than five. That's just me. But Steve, what are you thinking on this? How's the yeah. caps? Well, uh, I think that uh, as far as the Capitals go, I mean, we kind of figured them out, right? You know, after the first the overtime game, I think that they, you know, they played a certain style and we were kind of like, okay, we see what's going on here. You know, then, you know, the obviously the second two games were overtime as well. But by, you know, by the, the last two games, we had them figured for sure. And I mean, like they said, it was 12 games in a row, uh, one goal games or something. And all of a sudden, you know, now we're like, okay, I think we have this. And um, I was very glad that we were able to to dispatch them. And like, they call it the gentleman sweep. We gave them one at home and then we took them out. So that was, you know, that's fine with me. Yeah. The, the, Heather, you talk about the Washington Capitals series being close. And if you look at the, we're moving forward into the second round and the matchup against the, um, the New York Islanders in the regular season. Yes. The, um, the Islanders did have our number with a five, two, one in record. And the Boston Bruins, uh, pretty much 500 at a three, three and two record. Um, but if you look at the uh, the other numbers in the in the um, in the regular season, uh, they were 18 for 20 and goals for and goals against, and 20 for 18 on the on the Islanders side. The pe uh, penalty power play percentage 
was point sixteen point zero, and the Islanders was fifteen point zero, and the penalty kill percentage was eighty five for the Bruins and eighty four for the for the uh, Islanders. So it, this series is going to be as close as it was in Washington, but in my opinion, the, the Washington uh, Capital series was was very physical. I'm not sure if we're going to see this much physicality in the series against the Islanders. I think it's going to be more of an offensive uh, juggernaut, in my opinion, you know. Um, and with with those num- with thinking about those numbers and 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 the offensive production, um, the Boston Bruins really got to work after the trade deadline when they uh, they went three and zero. They had two regulation wins and uh, a win in overtime, uh, and but the 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 people, the players that were involved in the offense really caught my attention. In the April 15th game in a 4-1 to win over the Islanders, which was basically the, the second game after the trade deadline because they played Buffalo in, on the, I think it was the 14th or something like that. Um, Brad Marchand had uh, two goals and Taylor Hall had a goal. In the second game, April 16th, uh, it was 3 to nothing shutout. Taylor Hall had a goal. And the final game of the season in a three to two overtime win, Taylor Hall had the game winner in overtime, but he also had a regulation goal and uh, Brad Marchand had a goal too. So for me, the offense right there tells me that these guys were ready uh, after the trade deadline for an, um, a, a future series with these two uh, being matched up. So uh, I expect Taylor Hall and I expect Brad Marchand and I expect, everybody on the first and second line to really push forward against the team. That's going to, they're going to, the Islanders are going to grind. Yes, but they're going to come at you with, with uh, layers of offense and hopefully that the, uh, the Bruins can contain that. So uh, thoughts moving forward, Heather. Well, I was going to say, I think that as much as it pretty much is, even though they had five wins to three, we are very even in that way, but the difference in this series is that change. I think in physicality because Barry Trotz has this team, like it's like a running joke with the Islanders, right? Like they're a good team, but they're boring as shit to watch like their Jersey in 95, right? Because they are much better defensively than Washington. The reason why Washington's so physical is because their strength lies in their forwards. They're big, they're fast, they're whatever. Um, they have uh, the Islanders also have a lot of good people. I just I'll just throw out Pajot and Paul Mary have the Bruins number no matter where they lie. So that's yeah. something to look in. Brock Nelson always plays really well against us. Uh, and the Islanders we played at the beginning of the season, and the Bruins we were with injury or whatever we were standing coming into this new year were a different team than when we played them at the end. But at the same time, the Islanders are back to being a little more like the Islanders we saw them at the beginning. But the biggest factor, like I we we can match up to them offensively. And I, we are much better positioned to have the layers that, like you said, the Islanders have that we did not have. And I think we were all very nervous about, especially once we got towards the trade deadline and uh, right before literally just getting our asses handed to us by Washington. Uh, But what the big difference to me is the goaltending in this series is going to be a lot different like Washington and they had, I mean, they had, so like some Sanoff, oh, what else? I always want to say Samson off, but Samsonoff, he's a rookie, right? But like yes. Shishorkin or whatever, he, you know, he is not a rookie rookie, like the way a normal 25 year old rookie is. He's like a well-seasoned veteran who is pretty good. And also like Mark and I was in like Valarmoff on the flip side too. Like he's, a, he hasn't been the one that beat us this year, but he's played well against us they're going to be a lot better at challenging our top two lines and even our third and fourth line who can also put the puck in the net. Hopefully, you know, they're going to shut us a lot down. It's going to be hard. So we need to use our speed. That's all I can think is we need to use our speed to get up and around and not let them shut down, not let them control at their blue line. Like that's all I can think of, but that's going to be the big difference. That could be the difference maker, not, I'm not trying to bring out the Tuca haters because I think Tuca is Tuca and I love him. You know what I mean? Like, I love him. I stop pucks. Like I said, we're going to start doing an I stop puck segment on the show. Uh, But that's me. Like, if we can be fast, 
and we can actually be accurate because the first three games in Washington, we could not get that puck anywhere near towards like, a, yeah, I mean, I can still see Nick Ritchie's face like, what? Oh, it trickled over the line. Yay. Which was awesome. And key to what needed to happen right there. You went on dirty, weird goals and stuff like that, but you can also lose on those goals too. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. That's just my thought. Not to be long-winded, Steve. Thoughts? <laughs> but yeah, you got to take those dirty goals when you can get them because they don't always come for our side. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think as far as with the Islanders, I think that they're a slight bit faster than we are. But I mean, we've been working young guys into the lineup all year. I mean, we've you know we've got the veteran core, but we've definitely got a lot of fast young guys too. I think we match up well with them in speed. Uh, goaltending wise, it's going to be a lot different than against Washington. Washington really didn't have a set plan for who was going to play. I don't think every night. And then they, you know, I think we saw like three different guys. So, I mean, I think that, um, it's going to be a lot uh, tougher to get, you know, the type of goals we got in the last couple of games against Washington. I think we're going to have to fight for some stuff, but I, I mean, we can do it. Uh, the top line seems to be getting their stuff back together, like Pasternak and, and stuff. So I think that, you know, we're going to be able to manufacture some goals here and there. Uh, one thing that for me moving forward to the second round against the Islanders is is the history that it's few and far between, to be honest. Uh, in, in the years past, uh, before the COVID times and, and realignments and all this and that, which basically got us here, uh, in, in a normal year, we would not probably see the Islanders until, what, the conference finals? So... There's a big gap there. So, I mean, I mean, in previous years, we could say, okay, we're playing the Toronto Maple Leafs. Oh, we, we kick their ass all the time. We have, we have to have an advantage here. But because we don't see this team in the postseason so often, and the last time, honestly, was 1983 when the, when the Islanders were going through a dynasty and the Boston Bruins went up against these guys. And they, I think they lost in the conference finals in 83, 4-1 to one, or 4-2, to two, something like that. And uh, obviously they went on to win a Stanley Cup because they were just a, a wagon uh, of, a, of a team. Uh, them and the, uh, and the Edmonton Oilers in the early 80s were just were, were, were the decade killers back then of the National Hockey League. And then even before that, it was 1980 that these, these two teams, they matched up in the quarterfinals and, they, and the Bruins obviously lost. But um, really not a lot of comparisons when you think about the postseason and so on, but um, for me, it's going to definitely come down to uh, which defense and goaltending is is, is going to be on top of their game. Uh, Shostorkin, I think that's his name. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that That's it, right, Heather? Yeah, yeah, that's Shostorkin. Uh, yeah. Um, he's been just a, a really good player uh, on the back end for them. Um, but he can be beat. And, and Volan, Volan, I'm more, I was more nervous about Volamov in this series because of what he did in, during the regular season against us. But we're seeing a different goaltender. I'm sure that the video with Bob Asenza and, and Mike Dunham and all the goaltenders that are going to be involved um, are, are preparing for something like this. you got to get the, a goaltender like this, a young kid that's uh, really trying to prove himself. And he's and he's definitely doing it in his first postseason in the NHL. But uh, there's ways that he can be beaten, and we have to expose that. But to expose those opportunities, you still have to drive to the net, um, net front presence, uh, somebody there for a second chance opportunities if a rebound's uh, uh, fortunately given up. So it's it's going to be a test. But I, I really see this series being more offensive than than that than that grinding series that we went through. With the uh, with the Washington Capitals, yeah. Uh, I was gonna say that to go back to just you know, mentioning about Marshy and Taylor Hall about after you know since they were playing the Islanders, I think with Taylor Hall that this is the first time he's ever really got to just showcase all of his talents what he does have as opposed to having to be the number one guy and like one of the number one guys at least and try to do everything even if that not play his game, but play what they need him to do. And one thing about Taylor Hall, I think, and I never really, as much as I love him, have never really seen him because you never seen him play with a player necessarily. I mean, him and McDavid played for like a minute. I'm not saying Jersey hasn't had any other people when he was there, but they are all around players. You watch them. It's some players are really good in their own end or, and you know, in the neutral zone, but once they get in the, like you said, no one's going to net. No one's like, they don't have that. Hockey IQ, I guess. You know what I mean? But Taylor Hall and Brad Marchand are both two people who, for whatever time they're on the ice, 
they are doing their best to either stop the puck from going in their own end, you know, uh, trying to at least break up plays, uh, you know, taking their shots when they can get them. And if not realizing, you know, sometimes that dirty shot rebound is how, you know, you score. And I think that's important because that, again, takes the pressure off Krejci. Krejci has been trying to carry a second line for so long. The poor guy, I mean, he's probably lost two inches on his shoulders. And it's like Smith and Hall, that's what it does. And even though Krejci maybe wasn't as loud as he was the last few games of the season, he still was doing the right things that we like to see out of playoff Krejci, you know, and it takes the pressure off him. And that's having more complete players on the ice is making everyone else seem more relaxed, especially you saw that at the end of the series, right? Because everyone has different levels of playoff experience. Even Taylor Hall, right? He doesn't have a lot of playoff experience even then, you know? So, but I, I just wanted to bring that because when you watch Marshawn and Hall, like part of the reason you get so excited to watch those players is because they are all around players and they make the people around them better even when they're having trouble. And that's why I think we kept it together in the Capitals. Because like I said, there were t there were times when we couldn't get out of our own end. It was like half the damn period where like, hello, how long are we going to let the Washington Capitals fire on Tuka Rask. But at the same time, you know, Tuka, he means not an elite goaltender or anything, but you know, <laughs> it's just, we need them to be on. Do you know what I mean? Cause if they go off the rails then it's going to just, you know, because it is going to be a battle of who can get, we got two great goaltenders, no matter who's on whatever end, everybody's got good goaltending. Uh, their defense, I think is better put together only because of the system has been playing longer together and they don't have, a weird balance of super veterans and super low, but I just, we need more complete play, not just from them, from everyone, you know, it's from Corrali all the way up to Patrice, you know, you need everybody on the forward lines really doing their job. No fancy passes. No, I shoot the puck, but no one tries to get it back. Clear, clear skates. Get, we need to stay out of the box because that's when we're going to be in trouble. Even though our PK is really good. The Islanders are the type of team they capitalize. You know what I mean? They're not like had the Washington capitalize Capitals capitalized a little more in their power play. We would maybe would not be having the same conversation we're having today. We'd be talking about a postseason. So I don't know. I just wanted to bring it back. I don't know how you feel. Like who when you when watching like the Capitals series, who really stood out to you as like ready to go? Like we want to make a deep run. Come on, everyone, let's go. Besides those two players. What do you think, Steve? Well, oh, um, I would say uh, you can't discount the effort of a guy like Curtis Lazar. Like, my God, he's he's been just a fire plug out there. He's just unbelievable. Um, that guy is one of those guys. He used to – I remember when he played for Team Canada a few years back, he was just Johnny Hustle out there. He was just – you know, he, he loves the game. You can tell every shift. Just watch him out there. He's got a big smile on his face. He loves playing hockey. And he's one of those guys, he's determined to win. And I think, you know, it, with, he's going to be a supporting role. Obviously, he's probably going to pop a couple on the way. But, my God, he's just been just great out there. Like, what an addition. Him and him and Riley as well, just, you know, they just sparked up uh, the, the whole team. Yeah, Steve, you bring up Curtis Lazar and, and his addition to the Boston Bruins and uh, via the trade deadline. Um, previous to that, it almost seemed like that fourth line was lost in space a mm -hmm. lot of the times. And when, when that fourth line previous years was heavily relied on getting it, uh, being a nuisance to that top uh, line of your opponent. Um, but this season, it might've been because of COVID times, everybody's a little off mentally and so on, who knows, but that line was just not, not there for me. Like the, the, the uh, Wagner's were, were off, the Corrales were off and, you know, the, the mixture of uh, what forward's going to come in on the left side. But his addition brought up a very intriguing name um, uh, that that I kept hearing very shortly after his arrival, and that was identity. That line now has an identity, and what they do now is 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 just they are that nuisance. They can be that uh, that 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 grind line that just wears on you. And, and it almost reminds me of the Merlot line and, mm -hmm. and the success that that, that, um, that trio had. And hopefully the end result comes this year too, by the way, just yeah. saying, but um, no, it's just, it's good to have a line like that. For me, I really need to get the third line rolling. I want to see more out of Charlie Coyle. We saw a playoff Charlie Coyle last year in the bubble 
there was some really good things that we saw from him. I want to see him pick up uh, his point production because when he does that, uh, um, along with his puck possession, he tends to make his wingers so much better. So once we get him going, he compliments everybody else on the left and the right. And then we have a nice three lines of offense and one grind line. And that's the, that's the type of success that wins championships in my opinion. Oh yeah. You can't have one line just rolling for sure. No, you have to have everybody. Everybody has to contribute. And they have to be willing to step up if other people aren't. And that we struggled with a little this year, like not the met next men up. I'm not saying that, but just the kind of, you know, if the, like we talked about for a heavy in the season, how the offense was not giving the back end any kind of defensive support whatsoever. It was like, besides Patrice Berger, you know, the likely culprits, the offense was a hot mess as in helping their half young defensive core stop these teams from rolling in for, you know, sometimes. And luckily, I mean, we hadn't been as big of a mess, but there were times where it felt like the mess we all thought it might end up being. And I'm glad that we got that together, but the identity thing's interesting. Cause we've talked about that, right? It's like, it's not like the identity when like Krug and Chara and whoever, you know, there were a few people that no longer, you know, I mean, even like Nordstrom people who had been on the team for a while, part of that identity, when they walked out half the season has been, not that we lost our identity because it's still the Boston Bruins identity, but you get so reliant on people who help you create that identity, you know, and half this year, that was really, I think the growing process for this team and the trade deadline really kind of gave that last boost to uh, Lazat. Like you said, even just Mike Riley, sure. He struggles at time, but when he's on there, he's out there to do the best he can with his shifts. People like we talk about, like Steven Camper, people like that, who, they're not going to be your top pairing defenseman ever, but you don't need them to be. You need them to do exactly what they do right when they're doing it. I mean. Hey, Bruins fans. This is Bruce from Boston Sports and Music Memorabilia with your black and gold memorabilia moment of the week. We were incredibly honored to have hosted a private signing with the captain himself, Johnny Busick. He's the Bruins' all-time leading scorer. Of course, he won Stanley Cups in both 70 and 72. He was such a gracious host. He had us over to his home. We were drinking beers with Johnny Busick on his back deck. It was a great day. You can get something from our private signing here. We have photos, color photos here, dual inscribed, dual authenticated. This one says uh, Johnny Busick, 7072 Stanley Cup champs and Hall of Fame 1981. You can get a photo for just $25. Or choose this great Stanley Cup photo. As Johnny explained last week, nowadays everybody carries the puck around and there's a photo op. But back in the day, only Johnny Busick was given that honor. So you can get the Stanley Cup photo. Again, dual authenticated, dual inscribed and yours for just $25. And perhaps my favorite Johnny Busick photo of all time, here he is, 1970 Stanley Cup, holding a pair of Budweiser's in his hand. This is the This Bud's For You Johnny Busick photo, and this is yours for just $25. Or get the This Bud's For You special edition, Add it up to an 11 by 14. What a great gift for dad, $49. Or for just $29, you get your choice of two different Johnny Busick inscribed pucks. You can get the Hall of Fame 1981 or you can get NHL Top 100. Your choice, just $29. We are incredibly honored to have hosted Bruins legend Andy Moog at our private signing. Check out this great Andy Moog hand signed and inscribed puck. Yours for just $29. Or pick up one of these beautiful hand signed 8x10 Photos, get the black style photo or the white style photo, yours for just $28. You can get uh, this beautiful uh, framed special edition, 11 by 14 for just $49. For more information on our dozens of Bruins hand signed pieces and for your chance to win free memorabilia each week, check us out at our Facebook page, Boston Sports and Music Memorabilia. Or email me directly at bostonsportsandmusic at gmail.com. And be sure to check in each week 
right here to the Black and Gold Hockey Podcast. Let's go! Hopefully we can play a full game, you know? Um, like, even Nick Ritchie, right? And it's not even a, my thing with Nick Ritchie. But, like, Nick Ritchie in that first series had half Nick Ritchie that everyone had a heart on for all year. And half Nick Ritchie, why some of us still, like, whatever, we can't trust you yet, kind of play. So if he can get it back together and be more like Nick Ritchie that played all year, that's going to be important to the third line. Jake DeBrusque maybe hasn't necessarily, uh, you know, he's not scoring 50 you know, five goals last series, but he looks more like Jake DeBrusque. Like he feels more comfortable, whatever was on his chest and he got it off after that last benching. And he kind of said it out loud to everyone. Like, you want to know what's going on? This is what's going on with me. You know, I think saying out loud, let that young man breathe a little that, and not having to be crazy. Say, you know, like that second line has had so much pressure on them, but not enough support to really ever have created a second line. And now we have real lines. So hopefully everyone pops off. I still don't prefer Coyle on the wing. I nope. prefer him to be at center. Uh, that being said, he's not playing horrible at the wing as we normally do see him kind of seem really off. But I need Sean Corrali to get his shit together. I'm sorry to swear, and I've said it a million times, I love Sean Corrali. I'd be all in on re-signing him this year if he was Sean Corrali we re-signed before. But he hasn't been the Sean Corrali we re-signed before. And I don't want to see, you know, but maybe... We put Coyle back at center. We bump Lazar down and he sits and we figure it out. You know, I, that's just yeah. my thought on that. I, that's what makes me nervous is we've had six days off and you know how we do after rest. Well, seven days and uh, segue so- right into right into that, Heather. You talk about rest um, and concerns. I I am very on board with this trend that, um, you know, even if it's a regular season, if you, if you have – three or four days off, or it's one of those uh, stupid bye weeks that the NHL does uh, or a playoff series, which is just the most important time when you need to be fresh and on top of your game, but you have six days off. Heather, talk to me about your feelings. I know you touched on it just a little bit in the conversation a second ago, but that rest period and We've seen it in the Washington series in game one when you had a couple of days off. You kind of came into that series in game one and you it was more like a feel out process. And then the next four games were all bees. Do you see that same trend happening uh, happening uh, this in, in game one tonight? Or are we going to see Bruce Cassidy turn around? We need to show up in this series immediately and maybe have a fallback game later on. What are your thoughts? Well, on one hand, I don't I don't like when they have more than three days off. Same I don't think here. any team, any team really has a struggle after. That's just a long time, especially for a professional athlete to not be at their competitive peak. You know, for you and I and Steve, like we're normal humans. And even if we're in good shape, our whole entire uh ability to exercise or whatever perform and you know you're really good at tennis you like tennis well if you're not a professional tennis player you take five days off it's different than you know being a normal person doing it so it's important that they come out swinging tonight and I don't think that it's Cassidy doesn't try to make them feel that way I just feel like it's something maybe it is we have a lot of older players uh they're really banged up so I think the rest is good because it was so physical but still I'm a little worried about that I don't want to give the Islanders hope from the start. You know me. Mal- yep. Cobra Kai, baby. Like, just hit them hard <laughs> first. And this is a team that's hard for us to do that with. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. hopefully they come out swinging the start. Because, like you said, game three gets messy, you know, on the island or whatever. That's fine. But game one, first game back with the fans in the garden, 17,000 drunk-ass Bostonians <laughs> freaking out. You can't drop this game. You have to set the pace. And that's... That's one of the things I get worried just generally with us. We don't start the pace all the time. We've had more, we have more games where the second and third period or even the last five minutes is the best hockey we've played, just say all season. We need to set the tone the first five. You're not winning in our building. We smell the, you know, we smell going to the finals here in our whatever. They're not really conferences, whatever brackets. And they need to do that. And I am very worried that if, 
they don't, the Islanders could make it three to nothing by the end of the first period. And then everyone's deflated and it's going to get ugly from there. Sorry, Steve. I talk a lot. I'm sure you know. (laughs) Steve, is it, is the downtime an issue for you? Uh, there's, I got two points of view on that. I think for the older veteran guys, sure, they love having extra time off. Why not? I mean, there's no way that Tuca's 100%. He said in an interview yesterday, I don't think he's 100%. He said he's 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 feeling good. He said he doesn't feel, he doesn't feel great. Um, guys like Kregi and 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 uh, Marshawn takes a beating out there. I mean, he he's got to love just not getting pounded for a couple of days and. And um, well, Bergeron, I mean, as we know, I mean, he, that guy will play through anything. He played through a punctured lung at one point. So those type of guys, they love that sort of stuff. Now for like McAvoy, he's a competitor. He doesn't want to be sitting around. He wants to be like, okay, let's go, let's go, let's go. Even like Grizzlick as well, Carlo. Carlo, I mean, how many times did he get so close to the playoffs and then, you know, he was done. So, I mean, he's, he's, he's just wanting to go out there and have some more fun playoff experiences because for, to make up for the ones he missed. So, mm-hmm. I mean, like I said, it's 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 a good and bad thing, you know. For the the veteran guys are going to get to you know be at a hundred percent. The young guys are just looking to get out there. So I mean, you know, it's it's not ideal, I guess, really. But you know, it's it's the way it goes. It's the way it is. You got to deal with what you got to deal with. I saw something crazy on Twitter, and 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 let me see your shock face because Twitter said something crazy. <laughs> but. Somebody earlier this week mentioned the time off and and how bad the Bruins can be when they enter that first game or scenario back from uh, said time off. And he said, the Bruins should hold a scrimmage. And I was just like, please tell me. I, I really don't know if it was tongue or cheek or not. But do you, do you guys remember what happened the last time we had a scrimmage? A yeah. certain member of the Boston Bruins named Brad Marchand like, had a sprained wrist because somebody hacked him in that said <sighs> scrimmage. So Jeez. that's a big negative for me. We don't do scrimmages anymore. No. I think it was tongue in cheek, but still, it makes me uncomfortable even thinking about it. It was like exactly. when we played that gate when we played at the garden the other day, and all they wanted to talk about all day was losing the cup in the garden. Jesus, this is our market. Why are you trying to depress the crap out of us all day? Yeah. Like you know. Yeah. But yeah, no, I remember just like remember pasta a couple years ago falling down and like oh good good buddy i'm glad that happened there uh but um yeah no scrimmages no practices no even if it's messy game one there's still six more games that you could get your four wins in and uh yeah no mm, no (laughs) exactly um do you guys have anything else that you guys want to bring up any topics because i'm kind of fresh out on stuff right now um i didn't know if you guys wanted to touch a little on the Sweeney and Neely had a press when they were kind of talking like, Oh, we've tabled all negotiations till after the playoffs. But as Bruins fans, we heard that song and dance about a year ago. (laughs) Um, Any thoughts on like any vibes you felt about the re-signing Tuca or, and Krejci had said a couple weeks ago, someone had asked him about contracts, like during one of his interviews. And he's like, we're not talking about contracts right now. We're talking about playing the season and going, you know, just kind of, deflect it like they do but do you guys did you do you have any feelings or just feels from the pressers about are we going to re-sign some of our veteran ufas or not or do you think they truly haven't decided i don't feel like they can't have any thoughts on whether they're going to re-sign someone like crechey or rask who have been here forever in a day so what do you guys think how you feel about re-signing or what you thought nearly uh, mostly interesting to say Uh, yeah, I, I was going to say, um, I think Kreji will resign and he'll be at a discount because he knows, I think he's, he's he knows he's got a good winger there now in Hall and they want to sign him. So I think he'll say, okay, I'll take four or five-ish and, you know, give give you what you got to, to Hall. Um, Tuka's a, a kind of a mystery because um, he, he's kind of hinted, you know, even last year that he might want to retire. So I don't know what kind of, you know, offer they make to him. I don't know. I, I think you got to kind of give him around five or six and see how he, he takes it. I don't think he wants to play anywhere else. I think it's here or bust. And um, I think that he needs to uh, decide that himself over the summer. I guess it's going to depend on how this playoffs goes, but um, yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, there's a few of the, the other guys. Uh, I can't really think of the RFAs, but I mean, you got to watch the money. We have something like 24 in, in space. I think if, if the cap didn't change. So, I mean, there's going to have to be some some uh, some decisions made, obviously, about who you're keeping and who you're letting go. But yeah, I think the priority is is 
getting Craigie and Hall and keeping that line together and, and, you know, and then just seeing how Tuka's mind, how, how his mind is at regarding, you know, even just playing next year. Yeah, well, Don Sweeney's going to have a, a a hell of a plateful to to deal with. Um, not only are you considering bringing back David Krejci, Tuukka Rask, Taylor Hall, which all of those guys have to be considered after the uh, Seattle uh, expansion draft, yeah. because there's no reason why you'd sign them now, and then you know have Seattle come in and just like you know take it right out of the nest and see you later. We had they're only the signing Coast. people you don't want to protect. Right, exactly. Sean so, I mean, I'm looking at you, Sean Corelli. <laughs> yeah, I mean, have a verbal with these with these players and just say, listen, let's get past the expansion draft, and then we'll seriously sit down and talk um, after the uh, the season. And I like the way that the approach from the players is that that the focus should not be on uh, on extensions, contract extensions. It should be on the mission of winning a Stanley Cup this year. And uh, you know, by getting to the second round, the Boston Bruins are getting a closer closer to that goal. Um, and, and it's been 10 years since, uh, the last time this team won Stanley cup. I'd love to see it. I don't want to see it every decade. Uh, I'd like to see it every other, uh, you know, every, um, couple of years actually, <laughs> instead of, you know, 10. Um, but for me, I want to see Tuka back, Tuka back, uh, and work with Swayman. I, I do not see, uh, Yaroslav Falak in the picture. I obviously with the attitude that he's been pulling in practices and, and pu- pulling a fit uh, is showing that he's just not, he's checked out uh, mentally, physically and so on. So now it's time to move on, but it is always good to have a, a veteran with a uh, younger goaltender. And if that's the deal that's moving forward, uh, I would bring back Tuka Rask at a two year deal. I would hope he would accept a $5 million contract 10 for two seasons. It, 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 uh, it offers some flexibility in other areas. Um, and, and Don Sweeney's got to mastermind the, the, the uh, down talk on contracts on this one. I mean, we do have, if I'm not mistaken, Steve, I think it's a little higher than to the 30 mark, okay. maybe the 28 mark in the cap space as of right now. Um, but there's other areas that he has to concern himself with also, not just those three players that are UFAs at the end of this year, but he's also got to look at RFAs, uh, Charlie McAvoy a year after Brandon Carlo this off season. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more on the plate for him right now. So the cap management is going to be tricky for him, not only for this year, but moving forward and uh, reports out of the, uh, uh, from Elliot Friedman and Jeff Merrick on their awesome 31 thoughts podcast, actually this week, and I tweeted it out, they, they're speculating. Now, it's not in stone, but they're saying that they're hearing from people that are close to the situation that the salary cap could remain at $81.5 million for the next five years. Wow. So that cap management, with that aspect of everything and that avenue of, of, of the, uh, the highway mess that's going to be coming up for not only the Boston Bruins, but 32 teams now. Is just going to get increasingly hard when you can't, you know, you're not going to have so much money. So there's going to be a lot of cap casualties around there. There's going to be a lot of players that are going to be available, in my opinion. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know how he's going to get it done, but Don Sweeney somehow gets these players to sign at a lower cap value. Uh, he's seen it with Marshan. No, I'm sorry. We've seen it with um, with Pasenak, um and McAvoy and the and the bridge deals and so on. So I think. They can get it done, especially if they if they come this close. They come this close to winning the cup this year, and they just don't get it. Next season is going to be a critical year for everybody, whether it be the players, Bruins management, or whatever. It's just you got to go all in at that point to get it done because the window is closing. Believe it or not. Yeah, it's half. It's already half closed. I I don't. I think it was Kim Neely maybe was on the chirp or something. One, I don't know what podcast it was. They all blend together. I listened to so many of them, but said an interesting thing about Tuca that a lot of people, because he controls his emotion, you know, which is kind of a European thing. And also just, uh, it, it reads wrong. And we've had other people mention that too. Like maybe people just don't get Tuca's personality, but Neely made an interesting comment that like, remember when Tuca was younger and he would literally lose his shit in Providence, like just the, that he's kind of gone the extreme the other way. And because of that, sometimes it comes off of like, he doesn't care. 
And Neely's like, this guy really cares. He really cares. But he, we also can't have, you know, him smashing sticks and whatever else. You know what I mean? In there. He's like, so it's kind of like people can't get Tuka because they've seen such extremes of him and he doesn't really read well, you know, and he's got kind of an odd thing. So I just thought that was interesting about him. Like, so for everyone who says Tuka doesn't care about this team, apparently he does care about this team. He's just trying not to be psycho Tuka and there. But I don't know, boys. Let's go round two. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, any final thoughts on this? I'm ready. I'm ready for tonight. Uh, it's going to be a jam packed house. I think that this seeing the increased amount of people in the stands are going to just create more energy for this team. Uh, individuals that have been pretty much on lockdown for so long. And it's almost like you're holding a dove out, out your window and letting it go into the into the wild. I think that they're going to feed off of something like this. Um, and and I don't know. I, I'm saying Bruins in six, and that's a stretch because when you look at the just how close these these two clubs are and the numbers during the regular season, you know you definitely could could you know navigate to seven games. But I would much rather get it done in six. Um, use a little bit of rest uh, to your benefit. And I know that I know we talked about the rest earlier and how much we don't really like it, but you know, as, as you get further into these Stanley Cup playoffs, it's apparent. You know, it really is that you need to rest and so on. And you know, guys like guys like Kevin Miller, who's who's you know going to be a whole, whole. Well, never mind. I I sorry about that. I don't think he's playing. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> My bad. But uh, Steve, what do you think? Um, you know, the the veteran core, they know how to win. They've been there before. You know, this core's had been to three finals already, lost two of them, mind you. But I think that they know how to win. It's it's inbred in them now that they can go out there and they can just, you know, they can control a game. They just have to have that philosophy rub off on some of the younger guys and some of the some of the newer guys. Um, I think that um you're right about the six. Um, but I, I do see Boston coming out of this. I just feel like they're playing uh, at a better level now. And again, you can go by regular season record with the Islanders, but I mean, since the trade deadline, it's a completely different team. It's it's definitely a lot better restructured now. Uh, Credgy's happy. He's got a line mate. I mean, Hall, definitely happy. I mean, he probably hasn't been this happy since his first couple of years in Edmonton. So I think that um, I think that we got a good shot at this. And like I said, they, they you know, you, as you said yourself, that the guys, you know, the windows getting, you know, getting closed. I mean, I, I prefer not to say the windows closed, and I say that we're just uh, uh, putting in some uh, all weather windows instead and getting some new guys in there. <laughs> so yeah. I think, I think, as you said, I mean, wh- where where chair has been gone and stuff, they're starting to realize, okay, okay, this really does have a, f- a sense of finality to it, you know, eventually, and we got to do something. And I think this is the best shot they're going to have for sure. And I think they have a good shot of of getting to the finals for sure. Yeah. You talk about Taylor Hall uh, going back again. Uh, I was listening to the, uh, this week short shift podcast with um, Thomas Nystrom and Andrew Johnson. Fantastic program. I highly recommend it. They were talking about how they've like looked back into history, you know, when, when, uh, when, they, when, when he was drafted and Sagan and drafted, he, you didn't see him smile much, but all of a sudden it's like, you see in a, a a different player. You've seen him smile. You've seen him engage more with his teammates. And that is a catalyst for success right there is, Mm -hmm. is happiness. And, and, and what he's done on this Boston Bruins team since coming here, pretty much a point per game, pretty much uh, everything that the hype was all built up about what is coming true. And, and when you get that, that's just good. That's a good recipe for success. And um, hopefully that transpires throughout that whole bench because we all need the positive, but you also need the production on and off the ice. So I, I think it's going to be a good series. It's not going to be easy. I, I guarantee it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a little bit of a grind. It's going to be, a, I, I believe, a, a, a more offensive um, um, battle. But uh, it's, I, I think it's going to be a, just a, one of those playoff series that you're going to love. And I'm also looking forward to, uh, to watching the live stream with uh, um, Bastille Maria and Frankie Borelli because they are doing a live stream from Borelli's Pizza down in the island. So that should be a freaking funny thing. I want to see Frankie go nuts. 
<laughs> yeah, that that ought to be funny to watch. I love those two. Absolutely. They love their team so much too. And just even when they do like a short podcast together or little clips, sometimes they're just great. There, that place has been rocking every game. They <laughs> like if you look, look in the studios there at Barstool, everyone's on the cut losing their stuff. Although Biz, we're gonna talk about your hair. And good yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, looks like something straight out of freaking Mario Brothers. Um, well, this is random. I also wanted to, because in a normal show when we do thing, I wanted to say happy birthday to Chris Wagner and David Pasnack. David Pasnack, all grown up a quarter of a century old. What's up, guy? Going to be a dad, everything. And happy birthday to Chris. Turn the big 3-0. Mayor Walpole doing yeah. things. So I just wanted to say happy birthday, boys. And mainly also, also, happy birthday shout out to our boy, my boy, Jared Martin from the Dump and Change you. Hockey Podcast. Happy birthday, my friend. Hopefully you have a great day. Big Bruins win for you tonight. Yeah. So anyway, uh, let's Boy. wrap this up. Let's wrap this up uh, real quick. I want to talk about our Patreon campaign and uh, announce a winner. So we do have a Patreon campaign. If you donate just $1 per episode, to this black and gold hockey podcast you'll be entered into win weekly giveaways we give a bruins related item whether it be a t-shirt a signed puck a signed uh, eight by ten photo every week but you also be involved in our monthly jersey giveaway where we buy we use half of your funds so it's a so you donate a dollar we take 50 cents of that and throw it into a kitty and buy a jersey and um i have a couple here that i want to show this is, I mean, we have them, we have them going out till like, um, January, no, uh, March, 2022. So we have like another nine to 10 months of, of, uh, awesome stuff. And look at another picture right here. So just donate $1. That's it. And you'll be entered in to win these fantastic weekly prizes. And believe it or not, this week goes to our friend. She is the best. She calls into 98.5 all the time and all the radio stations. Maria from Watertown is this week's uh, Black and Gold listener giveaway winner. So congratulations to Maria. Thank you. Thank you for your contributions every week. You are an amazing person. With that being said. spicy the last couple yes, weeks. Yes, she is. It's, 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 she play, has it. it's playoff Maria. Yeah, playoff Maria. <laughs> you got playoff Krejci, you got playoff this, you got playoff that. We have playoff Maria. Yeah, yeah. So, boys, let's go. Maybe yes, we'll get absolutely. together soon. Yeah, I, um, I do want to take a moment right here to really seriously thank uh, Steve McEachern for coming on and what he's done in the past week. We've we've connected several times. The communications and the technology just didn't work out. Seems to be working fine today. Hmm, yep. Wonder. But anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I do want to thank you for your time and and uh, your patience and uh, and for that. Well, I didn't want to just uh, swipe you under the rug of a round table discussion, but also wanted to, you know, make sure that I thanked you personally and got you onto our weekly program and to talk about uh, the upcoming series against the Islanders. So thank you very much for the time. I truly appreciate it. And your friendship and your retweets of our, of our stuff oh, yeah. have been amazing. So you're, you're a great supporter and we will definitely have you back on when we do another round table. Maybe Excellent. we'll get another person or two other people back on here and just kind of, you know, rumble it up, have a couple of brews and yeah. talk some bees. Yeah, for sure. No problem. I, I love coming on. And like I said, it's, it's, you know, no problem for me to talk about the Bruins. I, I'm doing it anyway. So I might as well, you know, get it out in public, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely. Heather, well, as always. So yeah. Heather, as always, that. thank you very much. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say you guys, Say, I was gonna say, stay safe up there in the Maritimes. I know the yep. border's still closed, but that's all mm -hmm. I want to say. Thanks for coming on and just stay safe. That's all. No problem. All right. Thanks again, Steve. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to this roundtable discussion of the Boston Bruins and New York Islanders uh, second round series. We want to say, please go to your platform, your listening platforms that you're currently on. Please rate and review. If you're on um, YouTube, please give a thumbs up to this video and subscribe. We're going to be doing these more often. We saw, Sorry about the uploads. Technology has not been my forte the past couple of weeks, so I haven't been doing many uploads on the YouTube. So we're going to start getting back into it. So thank you very much, everybody. Peace out. Be safe. Go Bruins. Let's do this. Let's do this. The next time we talk, we could be game three in, in a roundtable on Wednesday, and then we'll come back to our regular programming on Sunday. So 
we'll figure it out. But until then, thanks everybody for, for tuning in the contributions financially, the retweets, the shares, the everything that you guys do. You are absolutely amazing creatures and I love you. So peace out. Peace. Thanks again for listening to and supporting the Black and Gold Hockey Podcast. Please share the show with your friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe to and leave a five-star rating for the show on your favorite podcast platforms such as Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, and SoundCloud. Between shows, help us keep the Bruins talk going by visiting our website, blackandgoldhockey.com, by sending an email to blackandgoldhockeyblog at gmail.com, and by following the show on Twitter at blackandgoldpod. Peace out.